Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. My goal is to provide those serving in the military or those who have served in the military different pictures of possible career paths and some advice on how to get there. Today's episode number 120 with Tim Patterson. You know, I thought I was a big shot traveler until I met these people and I realized I was nothing and they were incredible. I read books and seen movies and TV shows where people take their motorcycles around the world and it's very easy to watch that and say, well, that guy's crazy or that guy's got a fortune or that guy's got some unbelievable circumstance that, that makes that possible. And when I met a bunch of people in real life who had done these long distance motorcycle trips and, and I realized they're just ordinary people and they're just very passionate and excited about what they do, and it's possible for anyone to do it. So we're just going to jump right into today's episode. It's different than any other interview I've done so far and that Tim took four years after active duty to travel uh, the world, 28,000 miles by motorcycle, and that's just half of his journey. Um, as always, at beyondtheuniform.io, there's show notes with links to all the different books he recommends, all the different resources. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. It's a great way to stay in touch with what's going on with the Beyond the Uniform community. And if you haven't given us a uh, good review on iTunes, that would be greatly appreciated. One last thing. Um, after the interview, Tim shared the story of the time he almost quit on uh, his motorcycle adventure and how Renata, a uh, possible figment of his imagination, helped him continue on that journey. So stick around after the show if you want to hear that story. And other than that, let's dive in to my interview with Tim Patterson. Well, joining me today in New York, normally somewhere in some crazy location in the world, but today in New York is Tim Patterson. Tim, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, Justin. Um, so for listeners, um, I'll give Tim's background in a second. I, I think that uh, there's a couple reasons I wanted to have Tim on the show today. So Tim's a good friend of mine, a uh, good guy. Uh, one of the things that comes up in a lot of these interviews is self-knowledge, like the importance of really understanding yourself and what you want to do. And a lot of vets have just talked about um, that they rushed that transition from the military into whatever they do for a living, and they wish they had had more time. And as you'll find out, Tim has taken a lot of time to, to travel and do things that I've, I've never really had anyone on the show talk about before. So excited for you to hear his story. So here's Tim's background. Um, he started out at the Naval Academy as part of the Mighty Class of 2002. We were both actually uh, electrical engineering majors together. Yeah. <laughs> he served as an officer on board nuclear submarines for eight years. And once he made the transition from the Navy, he spent over four years traveling the world. Um, two of those four years were done by BMW Motorcycle, where he rode over 28,000 miles along the Pan American Highway from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to Ushaya, Argentina. I'm probably mispronouncing both of those. Uh, You're he, good. He, stand, he studied Spanish in Guatemala, served, uh, survived Arctic weather, flat tires, and Colombian soldiers. And I'll just add that, uh, you know, when we were both in the Navy, Tim and I would always be traveling and trading stories. We went to uh, Kilimanjaro, climbed Kilimanjaro together, and Zanzibar together, but Tim definitely took things 10 steps further than I did. So, Tim, excited to have you with me today. Well, thanks. Um, that's a very uh, very positive description uh, you gave. <laughs> um, so I'm, I was trying to think back, and maybe as a starting point, I was trying to think back. And um, When you were on active duty, you know, what, what were you doing that made this journey possible? Um, well... It, it really began when the thinking, the thinking process for the traveling really began when we were at the Naval Academy. And I think it was one summer, you know how we would do summer training every summer and it would, usually the training would last for about half the summer or two thirds of the summer. And then you get, you get three or four weeks off. And one summer, I think after second class year, I think that's when it was, I went on a trip to Europe backpacking with uh, some guys from the academy. It was Brett Bear, Ben Carter, and uh, who, there was one other guy. I think I want to say Eric Johnson. I'm, I'm probably misremembering that. In any case, we went we went to Italy and Austria and France for about three weeks backpacking, and that trip really opened my eyes to. And that's that's really a tame trip, but like for for a 20 year olds or 21 year olds, 
um, it's pretty exciting. You know, the first first time you've really been to Europe, and and that we met met a lot of people on that trip who were doing longer, bigger, more adventurous travels. And that trip was just sort of sparked an idea in my mind, um, and it got me it got me addicted or got me hooked on traveling. Um, it was the thing I, I I thought about constantly. I thought about it all the time. Um, you know, it sort of became an obsession. And then, you know, we we came back to the academy in the fall. I guess that was the fall of first year. And I remember um, over winter break, over winter break after I finished my last final exam. I was going to, I had this crazy plan to take a space A flight to Europe during our like three week Christmas break. And I don't know if you remember Aaron Arpey, Aaron Arpey, I think was also a double E major. And I, I had been chatting with him about my, my schemes and Aaron said, Hey, well, let's go on a trip to Europe together. And this was like my second big trip to Europe. So Aaron finished his exams a couple of days ahead of me and he'd bought a commercial ticket and he flew to Germany. And I was gonna, I was gonna show up as soon as I finished my last exam. I was gonna rush to the space a, the, the Air Force Base in Dover, Delaware. I was gonna drive my car there, leave it, jump on a flight to Germany, and I was gonna get to Switzerland. I was gonna get to Verbier, Switzerland, and find Aaron Arby. And that was literally like the entire extent of our plan was go to Verbier and find Aaron Arby. And I'm and thinking too. I'm thinking too. This is, uh, you know, this is before probably. I mean, you, you didn't have a phone with you, right? This was before you had like a yeah. phone that you could travel with internationally. So no this phones. Was like probably going to like an internet cafe if you weren't able to meet up, right? Totally, yeah. totally. So what, what we did is I, I finished my last final exam at the academy, went back to my room and I emailed Aaron and I said, Aaron, I think I, I had a message from him uh, waiting for me. And he said, hey, I'm in Verbier, Switzerland. You know, I'm skiing. Uh, when are you going to show up? And I emailed him back and I said, Aaron, don't go anywhere. I'm on the way. And I drove home to Pennsylvania that day. I think the very next like morning or the next evening, I left. You know, I, I packed up a bunch of stuff, um, drove to Dover, Delaware, uh, got on the next flight, uh, landed in Ramstein, Germany, got a taxi to a train. You know, took a couple trains. I slept either on a train or in a train station. I fell asleep on a train somewhere in Switzerland. I woke up in Geneva. I, I had to backtrack a little bit on another train. Eventually, I don't know, it's been it's been two days, two and a half days since I emailed Aaron Arpey. I'm riding, I got off the trains, I was on a bus, then I was on a, like a, you have to take a ski lift. In those days, or a gondola from the road to get up into the town. It's a huge ski town. And I, I rode right up on this gondola. I step out of the gondola onto a sidewalk in Verbier, Switzerland. And I literally just, I just like turn around on the sidewalk. I'm trying to get my bearings. And then I hear this voice and, and somebody says, hey, Tim. And it's Aaron, <laughs> it's Aaron Arpey like standing right there. Like he was out for like, you know, out to get his morning coffee or something. And I never had to email. I never had to look for him. He was just, he was just waiting there. And, um, and it was perfect. And we just, we, 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 did, we hung out in Verbier. We did some hiking. We went to Munich and we went to, Dachau and we went I think we went to I know I think I think I forget all the places we went um I think I ended up leaving Europe after about 10 or 12 days so I could spend Christmas with my parents and Aaron stayed in Europe a little longer but that was anyways that trip it was just one more um sort of uh it was an experiment and it just it just kept giving me more ideas of like how, how much bigger and farther I could take this idea of traveling. And, and the, the other thing was every, every trip I went on, you know, this was very early in the process at the Naval Academy, every trip I went on made me want to do it more and more and more. Like I never felt satisfied. I always felt like this is great and I have to do more. And, and the thing is, the more you travel, the more you, and I, I don't know if I assume other people are like me, the more you learn about places you hadn't heard about before and, and um, opportunities and, and things you just hadn't been aware of. And so your list of places you want to travel, it never gets shorter. It just gets longer and longer. And, and so point being was, um, yeah, I did those, that summer trip and the, the Christmas trip. And uh, uh, then I did a spring break trip and, and then we graduated. And I think I did, what was that program at the Academy where you can study a foreign language um, abroad? Um, 
it was called like Cox Fund. Do you yeah, remember? That? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So then as soon as we graduated, I think I had like two months of Cox Fund set up in France and I um I spent a month in Nice studying and then I spent a month working at the US Embassy in Paris. And then and then about towards the end of my the like the last week of my time in Nice, I um I actually just left Nice and I flew to Beirut. I had met I had made some friends or made a friend in Nice and uh he had uh, lived in the Middle East and traveled in the Middle East and he said hey like let's just get out of here this place is boring why are we studying French let's go travel to Beirut and um, this was in summer of 2002 and we flew to Beirut and and um, we stayed at the the American University of Beirut they had one of the one of the like administrators was was like a friend of a friend and and um me and my friend Rafi, we stayed. He, I think the guy we stayed with was the the CFO for the entire university, and this guy had just these incredible stories of living in in Lebanon and living in Greece. And um, we somehow we got into these like crazy situations in Lebanon. We um, we were out driving when we like my friend Rafi had other friends living in Lebanon. We ended up driving driving around the country one day, we were looking, I don't know what we were looking for. We ended up at the Syrian border by accident. And these Syrian soldiers, this was, this was in 2002 when Syria was not yet in total chaos. And, um, but they politely turned us back from the border. Um, we drove down, we drove down to see the Golan Heights. We drove to see the border of uh, Israel and Lebanon. We saw we saw people who were obviously either affiliated with Hezbollah or supporters of Hezbollah. Like we saw crazy things, and um, then Rafi said to me one day, he said, "Hey, what do you think about going to Syria?" Like, and this keep in mind, this all happened in like the span of like nine or ten days that this this trip that we did to the Middle East. He said, "What do you think about going to Syria?" And I said, "That's awesome. Let's. How do we do that?" Because you had to get a you'd have, you'd have to have a visa for Syria as an American, and I thought that would take like a month or it would take a long time. And Rafi called up his dad in the U.S. He's a he's a professor at Harvard, and his dad I guess was friends with a, a Lebanese government minister, mm. and and they made so they made some phone calls. And this we met with the the next morning we had a meeting with the Lebanese minister of culture, and he brings us into his office. He serves us coffee. He says, I hear you want to go to Syria. We said, Yeah. And he said, OK, um, I'll make some calls. And he arranged for us to get into Syria on short notice, on like 24 hours notice. And he said, tomorrow, I want you to show up at this particular border crossing at a certain time, like 10 a.m. And uh, show them your passports and they'll be expecting you. And we said, oh, great. Sure, let's do it. And uh, we, we jumped in a taxi the next morning. Um, for the, the drive, I think it was about a five hour drive between Beirut and, and Damascus. And there were lots of taxis on that road and we got we got to the border. I remember we we bought loaves of bread and cartons of cigarettes and we stuffed them into the trunk of the taxi. Um, and uh, the reason was that we knew we knew at the border that the, the Syrian border guards would inspect the car. And it was just sort of, um, we, by word of mouth, we knew that if we put some nice things in the trunk of the car, they could, you know, casually pull them out while we were looking the other way. And uh, they would just politely let us through the, the border. And that <laughs> was like the, the subtle bribe. Yeah, yeah. And, and what do we care? Like loaves of bread and cigarettes? Like that doesn't seem um, like anything bad to me. So sure, why not? And, and um, you know, if you look back to 2002, I think Syria was just Syria, like it was just this very isolated, um, you know, very uncommon destination that was ruled by a dictator and just had this, this bizarre reputation. And it was in the middle of the desert. And and but it wasn't it wasn't in a civil war. There wasn't, um, you know, ISIS. There weren't there weren't all of these, the, the current problems to worry about, it was still possible to visit there and, and be fairly confident about your safety, I thought. And, and we were right, it was, it was fine. Um, and uh, anyways, we, we ended up, we got into, 
We got into Damascus, spent a day or two there. Um, I think they were, I think the, the hotel where we stayed was bugged. Um, but that's, a, I wasn't, I don't want to go deep into that story, but. <laughs> well, well, we'll get into other, other crazy travel stories, but I'm, I'm wondering, uh, let's say someone's on active duty and they're listening and, and yeah. they feel the same way you do. They want to take time to travel. How much yeah. money do they need to save up? Like, I'm wondering, like you had this dream what was your goal for savings to be able to have enough money to be able to travel? Um, okay. This, this question, like it, everything depends on like what length of time you're talking about. If you're, if you're on active duty right now, like, I, I don't know what other people's situations are, but on the submarine, like, or, or even on my short tour, like the most I would ever real most time off I would ever realistically get might be like two weeks you know, that they would let me take it one time. Um, you know, it didn't matter if I had 60 days of leave stored up two weeks was usually maybe, maybe three in an, you know, an unusual circumstance, but, but you're looking at, if you're on active duty, everything you do is going to be a short trip. I, you know, any, I, I say anything under a month is, is a short trip. Um, and, and the other thing is if you're on active duty and you're in the United States, you're based in the United States, like a lot of destinations you're going to have long flights and expensive flights. So, so the price of traveling while you're, you know, when it's a short trip and if you're leaving from the U S it's going to be higher than, than in other situations. Um, but you know what? So while I was in the Navy at very, at various points, I was based in Japan, in Bahrain. Um, and I did trips from there when I did, when I did an IA to Afghanistan in 2009, this was like, this is something they don't tell you, or I, I had no idea about when you're on an IA tour, you know, you get something like 15 days of leave in the middle of your, your deployment and the government will buy you a round trip flight to basically anywhere in the world during your leave. And most people, I would say 90% of people just get on the flight back to the U S to see their family for two weeks. And I said, I don't want to do that. I want to go somewhere crazy or you know, not crazy, but somewhere exciting. And so I flew to South Africa. I flew to Cape Town, South Africa, um, during my, my break from Afghanistan. And I, I spent those two weeks in like Cape Town and I went to Namibia and I was like, I rented a pickup truck and was like driving through sand dunes in Namibia or something. But, um, you asked about money. Um, so, well, let me say first. So if you're thinking about traveling and you're still on active duty, it's super hard because of the time constraints is always super hard and the flights are always going to be more expensive. And that's, it's difficult. Um, when you get out of the Navy or you get out of the military, um, if you're not yet committed to a new job or committed to going back to school, like if you have a flexible schedule, you can travel for an extended period of time and you can do it for way more, far more cheaply than you imagine. Like the average price per day comes way down when you travel longer. Um, what was it and, for you for a year? Like, let's say for a, a typical year when you were traveling. Like, like, if you want like a precise dollar amount, like, I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I would say, like, when I was, okay, when I was in the Navy, I started saving, I think, while I was still a midshipman. Um, I had, I started investing in mutual funds when I was either a senior in high school or plebe year. I, I opened up a, a mutual fund account. I started doing that. And I would occasionally, not often, put just put money into it, and never I would never take money out. And once we became ensigns or lieutenant JG, um, I was putting in money. I, I, I set it up so that you know automatically every month I would invest money, and I just kept over time as we got to be you know lieutenants and whatever, I just kept increasing the amount of money I would put into my mutual funds every month. I, I looked a little, I looked a little bit at other things like, um, stock trading or ETFs or, you know, other things, but, but honestly, like the 99% of what I did was just putting money into mutual funds. And, and um, you, you essentially though, you traveled for basically four years without four, four ever, years. ever, ever being employed. Right. I mean, like you managed to, to, to put away enough money and live frugally enough to, to really stretch this out. Okay. Well, so if you think about your biggest expense when you're living somewhere, like if you're living here in New York city where I am or, 
or wherever you happen to be stationed, like your biggest expense is going to be your rent or your mortgage generally. Um, and then your second biggest expense would probably be your car. If you're, if you're paying off your car and then you've got, you know, insurance and, and then you've got your, you know, your food and your whatever else, gas and all the other expenses in your life. What I planned to do when I got out of the Navy was not have an apartment, not have a place to live, like not be paying rent. Instead I would be, and I didn't own a, well, I, end, I ended up buying a car, a used car shortly after I got out of the Navy, but that's whatever, not important right now. But the point is, I tried to minimize all of my expenses in the United States. Like any, like anything I didn't need to have or spend money on, I just cut that out. Um, I didn't have an apartment or a home. I, I uh, stayed with my parents um, for the first few weeks or the first month when I got out of the Navy while I was um, getting my life sorted out, getting my, I had to ship my household goods from Japan back to the US. I had, you know, um, get all that sorted out. And once the arrangements were, were made, then I just took my backpack and I got on a plane to France and, and I started traveling. Um, so what does it cost? I would say, I would say the price of traveling full time is, is probably equal to, or a little bit less than the price of just living in one place in the U S like imagine if, um, if you live in New York city, like, like right now, if I live in New York city, if I pay, I don't know, let's say I pay 1500 bucks a month in rent and you know, I don't have a car here. I probably spend another, let's say another 1500 bucks a month on food, transportation, entertainment, you know, it, go, it could go up, could be 2,500 if I, if I had thrown more like entertainment and go on some weekend trips, I buy a bunch of junk on Amazon. Like, so we're talking, you know, a normal living budget in New York city, let's say like 4,000 bucks a month, 3,000, three to 4,000 bucks a month living comfortably. Um, if you're not in New York and you don't pay for an apartment, you can just focus, you can devote all of that money to traveling. And I found that traveling costs generally even less, sometimes even less than like living in one place. So like 3,000 a month, 3,000 a month, you could easily, easily travel in comfort in total comfort pretty much anywhere. What, um, what were some, do you have any tips on, uh, what were things that helped you keep costs down? Were there any things in terms of like flights or transportation or where you oh, stayed? Yeah. Like how did you kind of, uh, what are some hacks for, uh, for, for keeping things as inexpensive as possible? Okay. Um, there's, there's all kinds of little things. Um, you know, flights, for example, just get a credit card that gives you frequent flyer points or frequent flyer miles. Um, and, save those miles to buy the most expensive flights, you know? So for example, I got a frequent flyer account with United and, um, I would charge all my regular expenses or as much as possible to my credit card. And over time you just, you just, if you do this for a few years, you'll accumulate tons and tons of miles. And I got, I had a free flight to New Zealand. I had a free round trip flight to, from the U S to Nepal. I had flights, free flights back from, from France to the U S or Brazil to the U S over the years. And it just, just get one of those, get one of those credit cards, get a frequent flyer account and, and use it as much as possible. Um, that's one thing. I mean, if you're still in the military, if you're still on active duty, use space a, um, fly space a to get from the U S to Europe. Um, I haven't tried, I haven't tried space a going to other regions of the world. I know it's possible. Um, but, um, the, the flights, when you're traveling, the flights can be, long distance flights can, will probably be the most expensive thing you have to buy. And if you can do that for free, like that's, that's probably a third of your money or half your money you're saving right there. Um, when I was younger, you know, when I, when I was like, when I was 30 and I got, when I got first got out of the Navy, uh, and I went to Europe, like I would stay in relatively cheap, like youth hostels. And I think there's, I think when you're in college or just out of college, like it's fun, it's, it's nice and it's super cheap and you don't mind the inconveniences or the, the lack of privacy in a hostel. And you know, as I've gotten older, like I don't like those places anymore. And I want, <laughs> I want to, no, it's just like, it's just like, this is just reality, man. Like I want to stay in a, in a decent hotel. I want to have a private room. I want to have some privacy and some comfort, but you don't have to stay in like a $300 hotel room everywhere you go. You can, you can find, perfectly adequate hotels for like, you know, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, depending on, on where you are. Like this, this summer, 
I traveled on the Trans-Siberian all the way across Russia, and I would say I, you know, the the price was anywhere between, you know, maybe twenty bucks or thirty bucks a night, sometimes up to forty bucks depending, but usually like twenty to thirty bucks for a a, a nice hotel room, privacy, you know, bathroom, everything you need, Wi-Fi, you got it all, and you save a ton of money. So, and that's, you know, if, if, you, if you do the math on that, like if you, I don't know, if you average 25 bucks a night for a hotel room, what does that come out to for a whole month? That comes out to like 750 bucks a month. Um, how much would you be paying on rent in the U S probably more than that, you know, or a mortgage in the U S probably way more than that. So whatever I was spending on a hotel room, I was, you know, it was costing me money, but it was costing me less than I would otherwise hanging out in the U S. Um, and I wanted I want to drill down on a couple different things, but what could you give the overview? So you know, four years of traveling. Do you have like numbers, like how many countries did you go to, or like what was the what's the yeah. the, the t- you know two or three sentence summary of what those four years were? Okay, well I I stopped counting how many countries. It's I don't know. I think now it's about seventy ish, um, but uh. What did I do for four years? I spent one year mostly in Europe. Um, I studied French in Europe, uh, traveled a little bit in West Africa. Um, I went to I went to the Himalayas, did and in, in India did some hiking to Everest Base Camp, climbed Island Peak. Uh, that was that was like the first year and a half, and then I um, I was looking for more like hiking and mountaineering type of adventures, so I went to. Argentina to climb Aconcagua, to go to Torres del Paine in Chile, and I started studying Spanish, and it was towards, uh, after about a year and a half or two years, I, I met quite a few motorcyclists, long distance, around the world motorcyclists in different places, especially in South America, and I, I decided that that was something I had to do, I wanted to do, and so after about, it was about two years into this traveling, I um, bought a motorcycle on Craigslist in Jersey City, and I, I, I don't think I knew it was going to take me two years. I think I, I think I sort of mentally planned to take about a year and a half with the motorcycle, and I was going to ride from the top of Alaska to the bottom of Argentina, and um, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I read, you know, the big thing. The big thing was. Um, this motorcycle rally I went to one weekend, um, where I, m- I met quite a few long distance riders who were, they would talk about their adventures and show pictures of their trips to places like Mongolia or, um, you know, East Africa or, or wherever they went. And, you know, I was totally awed and inspired and, um, you know, I thought I was a big shot traveler until I met these people and I realized I was nothing and they were incredible. And, and I knew uh, it was, it was just one of those um, chance encounters that like it was life changing. I knew immediately that, you know, my eyes had been opened to some, to this, this concept that I never thought was possible doing a, a, like an around the world or a halfway around the world motorcycle trip. And um, it's very, it's, you know, I've, I've read books and seen movies and TV shows where people take their motorcycles around the world. And it's very easy to watch that and say, well, you know, that guy's crazy or that guy's got a fortune or that guy's got some unbelievable, I don't know, circumstance that, that makes that possible. Um, and when I met a bunch of people in real life who had done these long distance motorcycle trips and, and I realized they're just ordinary people and they're just very passionate and excited about what they do. Um, and it's possible for anyone, like it's possible for anyone to do it. Um, I I just think it's crazy that you, you know, for after two years of traveling, which is, you know, honestly, that's, that's, um, a longer amount of time than I think anyone else I know has traveled. And then, then meeting people and realizing you were just at the, the tip of the iceberg and that's crazy. And, and I, I also think it's just kind of a cool message that it's, it's not, 
retired millionaires that can do this. It's, you know, it's, it's living frugally. It's like storing away some money, but it's, it's possible for more people than would imagine to be able to take this sort of adventure. Yeah. Um, you're totally right. It is possible. And, and the other thing I learned, like most of the riders that I met were, I would say they were mostly middle-aged, like in their forties, uh, maybe, you know, thirties to fifties was the, the prime age group because they had worked a little bit and saved a little money and they had some experience riding motorcycles and, um, you know, they just got to a point where they wanted to try this big adventure. And a lot of them, a lot of them had, um, major concerns about money because, you know, they had mortgages or they had a home or they had a family, they had things, they couldn't just turn their back on life and, and not, have any expenses and just ride a motorcycle like they they were real people and I learned a lot from them about you know these people would very often they were experts in camping they would they would camp all over the place on their motorcycle trips to save money they would do a lot of their own cooking they would do a lot of their own repairs or their you know they were very frugal at the same time that they were traveling around the world and having these incredible you know, they were having the time of their lives, but not spending too much money. They would, you know, and they would tell stories. The thing is, once you hear enough of these stories, they just make you believe more and more that that your the motorcycle trip you were dreaming of is totally possible. You know, there was a there was an Irish guy I listened to. He talked about pitching his tent in some old lady's garden in Brazil, and and he he, he said there were so many times when he would he would camp out in somebody's yard or near somebody's house, and they would they would give him permission, and then they they would get to know him. They would talk to him, and they'd say, "Hey, let me let me call my buddy, you know, a hundred miles down the road or two hundred miles down the road, and he'll let you stay at his house when you get to that town, you know." Or there, it's it, there were so many situations on my own trip where I met people along the way who were incredibly generous and open. I can't I can't tell you throughout Central America and South America how kind people were to me. Um, letting me, um, you know, just like, like there were people who cooked food for me. There were people who helped me fix my motorcycle when it broke down. There were people, you know, when I dropped the bike on the, when I, when I fell over on the side of the road and I had this like 500 pound motorcycle to pick up literally. Okay. Let me like in Argentina, in Argentina one day I was, I dropped my bike in this dirt kind of off, off the side of the road. And I was just staring at it, like, dreading, like picking this thing up because it's so heavy. And um, this car came barreling down a dirt road in Argentina, slams on the brakes when they see they, when they saw me. This this guy, I don't know, looked like a, like a kid in his twenties, leaps out of the car, runs toward me, grabs my bike, lifts it up, and he kind of hands it to me, and he just nods at me, and he runs back to his car, dives in, <laughs> and drives away. Like he barely said hello. And it's like this type of thing would happen everywhere. Like when I would, when I had a, I had a dead battery one day in Peru and I was, so I, I had taken the, my bike was parked on the side of a, a busy like downtown street and I had the, the bike opened up and the battery out and I was, I had like a wrench and a screwdriver and I was trying to reassemble everything at one point and it was getting later and later at night and it was it was like 9 p.m and it's dark out and there are people it was quite a busy sidewalk and and um three three kids like in their 20s approached me and they just like one of them like stuck his head inside the motorcycle and was like looking at the the cables and the wiring and and all of a sudden these guys just like showed up and started working on my motorcycle like for me and they like they helped me like I, I dropped some screws in the you know in the street and we were we were looking for the pieces together this Australian guy walked up and he was like oh I've got a motorcycle here um he ended up he, he took the battery out of his own motorcycle and he gave it to me and he said you know hey put this in your bike and drive it back to your your hostel or your hotel where you can lock it up for a while and then just you know walk back here and give me the battery when you're done um you know, basically, he saved me from having to like push my motorcycle through the streets for like a mile and a half, and uh, and and my motorcycle was really heavy, and that was it was just an incredibly generous thing, and this guy had no idea if I would ever come back or not with his with his battery, um, 
and people did that kind of thing all the time. Um, I and, love that, that uh, sense of like connection and community that comes through this. Like as you describe that, it's like it makes me want to travel so much. And you just realize you're part of this this global community of people. Yeah. I mean, what was your on, on the motorcycle portion? Like what was your day like? Are you driving? Are you riding like eight hours a day? And like how do you even pa are you just are you like listening to music or like how do you even pass the time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um like, here's the thing, you know, at the beginning, I think, yeah, you kind of had the, the, the mindset or I kind of had the mindset where like, I gotta, I gotta ride a certain distance every day. I gotta make progress on this trip. I gotta get down the road. I got, I gotta have a schedule. I gotta, you know, all these types of things. And, and you rush, 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 or I rushed at the beginning a little bit and then you exhaust yourself. And then you're like, this really sucks. And, and why am I doing this? And, and so, so what eventually, eventually once you sort of think about it, you, you realize that there's gotta be a better way and, and you have to balance, um, the riding and the relaxing and the fun parts of it with, you gotta balance the hard parts and the fun parts. Um, I would say like a typical, a typical thing would be, you know, I'd look at the map, I'd look at where I was going in say, trying to think of an example, let's say, let's say in Colombia, um, when I was in Colombia, um, I might ride three days in a row and I might ride say four to six hours, not even six would be, six would be a very long day. I would say four to five hours would be a typical day. And you know, you take breaks to get lunch, take breaks to get gas, take breaks, you know, to get coffee, whatever you need, because you know, the point isn't to grind yourself down. The point is to enjoy riding your motorcycle and take in the amazing landscapes and meet people and see other riders and, and just talk to the local people. So like on a day, on a day when you're riding four to five hours, like that riding might, you know, you might not, the whole thing might take you seven or eight hours, you know, with stopping and, and talking to people and taking pictures. And, um, and then you have to have, you have to have like days off. You have to have days when you're not riding because it's physically hard, it's physically exhausting. Um, it, it's, it makes your, your back and your shoulders and your butt, like everything gets sore, everything gets tired, your muscles get really stiff. You know, if you're in, you know, on the bike all the time, you know, it's sort of in that position of riding. So I might ride for three days and then when I arrive at a cool destination, I stay there for one day, two days, um, and I just see what's there and do what's there. Like, in, in Colombia, at one point I went to a paragliding school in Colombia. I think I stayed there for two weeks and I just, I took lessons in paragliding. Um, and I, I had a few rough landings, uh, while I was paragliding and I, um, decided paragliding was not for me in the long term, And, and I kept on riding my motorcycle and, um, there would be play. I'm trying to think of cool things like in Ecuador. When I got to Ecuador, I parked the bike for probably five days so that I could go hiking um, up some of the volcanoes in Ecuador and stay in some of these very remote villages in the mountains. Um, in Peru, I got to Juarez, Peru, and I think I parked my bike for two weeks. My, one of my sisters flew down, and we spent two weeks traveling together without the bike. We went to Machu Picchu and did the Inca Trail. and. Um, when she when she flew home, I went and picked up my motorcycle and kept on riding. So there were all along the way. There's always like places to stop and things to do. And in Argentina, I would stop and do hiking for two three days at a time. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not all just riding, and it's not eight hours a day. It's got to be it's got to be an amount that you can sustain over months and possibly years. And and. and you know, so many of the vets that I speak with, you know, and I, I felt this when I was coming off active duty, there's like this rush to go to school or this rush to go to your job. What advice would you have for someone on active duty about why they might want to take time to just travel and decompress after service? Well, um, I, Everybody's different, and I hesitate to say that my plan would work for everyone. Um, I think what's important is to to try to what's important is you try to figure out what you 
what makes you happy and what you want out of life. And if what you want, if you know, you know, if, if, if you've spent years dreaming about business school and that's what you want, then, then, you know, by all means go for that. If, if you've spent years dreaming about, you know, taking the next step into corporate America or working in like the tech sector in, you know, in Silicon Valley or whatever it is that you want, if, if you know that for certain, Hey, go for it. Um, for me, in my case, every day that I was in the Navy, I spent dreaming about traveling. Like that was constantly on my mind and it was my passion. Um, when I worked on the submarine, I would, I had a stack of outside magazine, uh, outside magazine stuffed in my closet that I could pick up when I, when I had a little bit of downtime to try to keep my spirits, keep my spirits up. Um, and I would, you know, I would cut out articles and rip out pages from outside that I wanted to save that, that I would try to incorporate into my later travel plans. Um, also I want to mention, I recently applied for a job at outside magazine and, and they better get back to me or I'm going to be super, <laughs> super, super pissed forever. Um, but, uh, no, but so what I would tell anyone getting out of the Navy is if you know what you want to do, then, then go do it. And, and I hope that makes you happy. Um, whether that's business, whether that's business school, whether that's some kind of master's degree or whatever it is you want to do. Um, if you don't know for sure what you want to do, then yeah, obviously I would, I would say take a little time to, um, think and, and figure, figure stuff out. You know, you asked, you asked what I did on the motorcycle. Was I listening to music? And, and no, I wasn't listening to music. Like I, I wore earplugs. I wear earplugs when I ride because my, like it's quite loud and, and I'm just sensitive about the, my hearing. And, uh, so the hours on the motorcycle turn into long, you know, long, a long time for thinking. You, you have a lot of time to do deep thinking and I would have conversations with myself in my head. Um, and I often spent time wondering like, why am I out here? Why do I want to do this? And, and I would think about my reasons and motivations and, uh, and my conclusion was like, this is, this was, what I had dreamed about and what I wanted. And, and yeah, there were times when it was extraordinarily uncomfortable and cold and exhausting and difficult. And I, I stressed out about the money at times and I stressed out about, you know, was I going to, was I going to get into a motorcycle accident or was I going to, you know, get robbed by, you know, a drug gang in Mexico or was I going to get murdered in Colombia? You know, and those are, all of those concerns were, were, were blown way out of proportion. Like they were not actually things I had to really worry about when I got to those places. Um, but having that time, having that time to think on the motorcycle, um, for many days for long periods of time was incredibly valuable to me. Um, and I think, I think anybody who's not sure about what they want to do, um, in the long term, I think traveling can help you, um, in the sense that it gives you, I think the, the point of traveling is often that it gives you time to think and evaluate your, your situation. And, you know, when you're on those like long train rides or bus rides or flights or the hours on the motorcycle or whatever it is you're doing, you know, the hours of hiking, um, it gives you time to think and evaluate what's most important to you in life and what you want to do in life. Um, so I that's why... I love that too because I, I think it's easy for me and for probably others listening to romanticize the four years you had and I just appreciate the context of the the kind of the pain and maybe the boredom and just kind of the frustration, the fear and just all of the um, really real emotions and like worries that come up during that. It wasn't, you know, when I okay. picture you riding your motorcycle, I picture like a sunny day and just everything's awesome. But there's also probably days where it was rainy and freezing and you, you didn't want to do it anymore. And, and you know, 28,000 oh, miles, it's a long time. And so, yeah, I, yeah that's, that's, um, it's, 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 it's good to hear you say that to realize that like, that's, that's part of what this, I imagine this journey was, was not always loving it, not always wanting to be on it, but just continuing with that, that mission and continuing with that journey. Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's a story I want to tell. Um, the thing, one of the things that frustrates me sometimes, here's, here's another important lesson I would, I would hope to impart on people listening if they've listened this far. Um, 
is that no matter what you choose to do, whether you know you're traveling like I did, or you're going to grad school, or you're getting a job, whatever whatever it is you're doing after the Navy, there will always be people who criticize you, and there will always be people who judge you, and there will always be people who say, "Well, that was a stupid decision. You know, you should have done this and this or that or some other thing." Everybody's going to have their own their own advice, and and the thing you have to do is ignore those people. You have to learn to ignore those people and find what you want for yourself. And that's a really, really difficult thing sometimes. And I, I struggled with that. And, and I like, I like to think I'm in a place now where I, uh, you know, I'm, com I make my own decisions and I'm confident and, and I do that for myself. And I, I can't recommend that enough. Um, you know, think about what you want and make your own decisions and just block out, you know, the haters, man, the haters going to hate. <laughs> I love so, it. What about, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious because I know we're running out of time. Um, I'm curious about resources. You talked about Outside Magazine. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance right now, which, you know, is, yeah. is playing into what you're saying. But what, what books or movies or magazines, you know, really either inspired you or helped you in your travels that you would recommend to someone listening if they're interested in them? Yeah. Well, before the motorcycle trip, so there were several – I was reading constantly um, a really good – motorcycle book travel book is um it's called the longest ride by emilio scotto this guy from argentina who spent 10 years on a honda goldwing traveling around the world he ended up he got married in, in the course of his 10 years of travels and um what he did was 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 beyond is, is beyond insane it's just in, incredible and um there's another book i read uh tim cahill wrote a book called road fever in that book he tried to set the Guinness world record for driving the fastest drive from the, the end of the road, the Southern end of the road in Argentina to the Northern end of the road in Alaska. And he did it. He did it in a pickup truck in something like 26 days or 25 days. And that was in the, I think the late eighties or early nineties. And his book was actually, his book gave me the idea or the inspiration for the, the, the end points for my own motorcycle trip for Prudhoe Bay, Alaska and Ushuaia, Argentina. Those points come from his book and, and I did a little bit of research, but, but in Alaska, there's only one road that goes to the Northern coast of Alaska to the Arctic ocean. And, um, in, in Argentina, all the, all the roads, um, and more or less in Argentina, in Ushuaia. Um, anyways, it's, uh, you know, those books were good. Um, were, were helpful. Uh, there's another book, Alex Roy, the driver, it had nothing to do with what I was doing, but it was about a guy. He was passionate about the Cannonball Run, um, basically the fastest you can drive from from New York to L.A. And he was familiar with guys who had done the Cannonball Run in the 80s, and he he tricked out a BMW M3 with extra gas tanks, extra electronics, um, did a lot of research and planning, and he he set the new record. Um, or he set a record at that time. This was maybe seven years ago, give or take, when Alex Roy set, set a new Cannonball Run record. I think his record was 32. Uh, no, the record he was trying to break was 32 hours, seven minutes, New York to L.A. There's a there's a DVD documentary about it that's pretty incredible. Um, you got to check out um, Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor, the actor, made two incredible motorcycle documentaries, uh, Long Way Round and Long Way Down, about his 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 journeys that were, I, I want to say three, four, five months long each where he did across Europe and Asia. Um, and he did, uh, from, he did a ride from London, uh, down through Africa to Cape town. Um, his journeys were also quite, um, helpful, inspirational and helpful for planning and showing, showing me like what was possible to do with a motorcycle. And I'll say like, like my trip from Alaska to Argentina was actually probably the, the easiest, quasi around the world trip that you can do with a motorcycle. Um, it's incredibly straightforward. The roads are 99% paved. Um, you don't have to do anything really challenging or dangerous. You just have to put in, put in the time, you know, one day after another. Um, and, you know, and, and I read things like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I read um, all kinds of travel books. You know, I would recommend if you're into travel, like, travel in general, like I would read things like, I would read Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. I would read The Zanzibar Chest 
Uh, it's a book about, it's the most incredible book about um, East Africa um, by Aidan Hartley. Um, he was a war correspondent who covered a lot of civil wars in East Africa. Um, I would recommend, what else? I, oh, I read tons of um, Paul Thoreau about, about his train journeys, the, the Great Railway Bazaar, Ghost Train to the Eastern Star, Dark Star Safari, um, The Last Train to Zona Verde, the, uh, he did one, The Old Patagonian Express. Like These are all books about traveling by train. Um, can't recommend him enough. Uh, in Japan, Alex Kerr wrote a book called Lost Japan. It's really incredible about traditional Japan. Um, I could go on and on and on. And, you know, I love travel books. I love these uh, documentaries. I love the books about motorcycles. I love books, books about, like, the history and the politics of, of different countries that I was visiting. Um, you still there, Justin? Yeah, yeah, no, I had I had myself on mute. I'm, I'm writing these down for the, the show notes. I didn't want my typing okay. to be distracting. Sure, like, and here's the thing, like, for example, when I was when I was traveling in a particular country, I would often try to read some of the literature of that country. You know, when I was in, in Chile, I would try to read Isabella Allende. Um, when, I'm just trying to remember some of the authors in, in Mexico and Guatemala, mm, there, there are some authors, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but everywhere I went, I would try to read some of the local stuff um, in, you know, like, I like, sorry, I'm running out of, I'm, I'm, my memory is failing me right now, in, um, no, no worries. I, I will, for listeners, I'm going to have links to all of these different books and resources in the show notes. I know we're, we're out of time. I wish we had more time to go into more of these oh, adventures, man. but oh, I, hope, I hope for listeners, this is like inspiration to, uh, right. you know, it's not only possible, but it's, it's easier to attain than you'd think. And just having that time to, to think and, and learn more about yourself and just have some time to decompress, I think is really incredible. So Tim, I appreciate your sharing your story today. I think this is really inspiring. Well, thank you, Justin. I hope it's uh, helpful to some of the people out there. Surface, surface, surface. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll share that story with you, the, Tim's last story about uh, the time he almost gave up on his motorcycle journey. A couple quick notes. Um, first, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, go to beyondtheuniform.io slash newsletter. Sign up there. That's the main reason, uh, main way I stay in touch with uh, listeners. Second, if you haven't had a chance to give us a positive review on iTunes, greatly appreciate that. It helps us get the word out about the show. And third, if uh, you haven't taken advantage of our Audible free trial, go to beyondtheuniform.io slash books. You'll get one free audio book. Beyond the Uniform gets $15 towards helping us keep the show going. Uh, Tim gave over 10 different book recommendations, so you can get one of those and listen to it as you drive, walk, run, uh, parachute, whatever it is you do. So here's Tim with one last story about his motorcycle adventures. We mentioned, or, 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 I was talking about how some days on the motorcycle were really miserable and really not there, you, you know. I think I think a lot of people, my my parents, have this idea that I've been on vacation for four years, and the truth is that the, the traveling is can be extraordinarily challenging at times. And so I wanted to bring up the story of how of, of the day I decided to quit when I was on the motorcycle. Probably about a month, month and a half into the journey, I was in Alaska, and I reached I reached Fairbanks, Alaska, which is more or less in the center of the state. And then to go north to the coast at Prudhoe Bay, it's about a two-day ride. If I remember right, it was about uh, I want to say 300 miles, 300-ish. I'm not I'm not remembering very clearly. I want to say it's about 300 miles, and um, most of that's on a dirt and gravel road, and you're out of you're out of there's no there's no towns, there's no cities, there's you're out of cell phone coverage. It's very remote, and I remember leaving. Fairbanks, Alaska, I stocked up on gas and I, um, I had to take an extra gas can for the, there's a couple stretches where you, you can run out of gas and you're just stranded and there's literally, you're, there's nothing, you're in the Arctic tundra if you, if you don't have any transportation. Um, so I rode the first day out of Fairbanks and it was raining, it was muddy, I was alone, I was cold and wet and, um, there was no one to talk. I was, I was just out there alone for the whole day. I camped out overnight. Um, 
I came across a gas station maybe 250 miles from the end of the road. And um, the on the second morning, I was I was having a very frustrating morning. It was drizzling. I eventually, you know, I was I was having a lot of thoughts about um, turning around and not going to the end of the road at Prudhoe Bay. And this had been getting to Prudhoe Bay had been sort of that that had been the framework for the whole trip. The, that had been sort of the starting point. The plan of the whole trip was to get to Prudhoe Bay and then ride south to Argentina. And and I knew I would regret. If I, I would regret it seriously if I didn't get to Prudhoe Bay for the whole the next year and a half, like I was going to think about how I hadn't hadn't gone to Prudhoe Bay and I was trying to finish this journey and it just it wouldn't make sense. And um, I got as far as the Arctic Circle. There's a there's a pull off and a dirt parking area and a big sign that says you're at the Arctic Circle. And I pulled over there. I was the only person there. Um, took off my helmet and I, I took some pictures of my bike in front of the Arctic Circle sign and. I was so miserable. I was scared. I was scared of like wiping out in the mud and like falling down and breaking my leg or something, you know, breaking something and then being stuck out there and injured and not, you know, I, I guess that was one thought, but I was just, I was just scared really. Um, being out there, being alone on the motorcycle is, is really challenging at times. And, um, you know, just the cold and the rain and everything made it miserable. And, um, so I decided while I was standing there, I decided to quit. I wasn't going to go to Prudhoe Bay, and I felt I felt so shitty. That, that's the only word. Like I just felt <laughs> I, I felt embarrassed, ashamed, like sad. Just I was very disappointed in myself that I had given in to this urge to quit, and um, I was going to take a minute and just you know get my gear on and and turn around and ride south and just be miserable for a long time. And at that moment, another motorcycle, I heard the sound of another motorcycle and another guy on a BMW 1200 GS, he, he rode up, he pulls up into the, the parking area and he stops right next to me and he turned off the bike and he climbs off his bike. And this guy is enormous. He's like six foot three, easily like 240 pounds, this enormous dude. And he takes off his helmet. And he's got this really long, like black hair. And he, he just looks at me and he says... I am Renato. I come from Brazil. I ride here in 33 days. <laughs> he says, he says, I go to Prudhoe Bay. You go to Prudhoe Bay? Okay, we go. We go. And he just looks at me and I, and I tried to argue with Renato. I was like, no, 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 no man, man, I, I'm not going. I've, I've had enough. You know, I, I tried to like politely tell him like I, I was quitting and, um, he just, he just kept on me and he wouldn't stop. And he, he basically said, get your, get your helmet on. We're going. And we're going to do this. And he, you know, meanwhile, some guy in a Jeep pulled into the parking area. He got this guy named, I think his name was Matt from Switzerland in a Jeep. And he got this guy to join us. So there were now, there were three of us now. And he said, <laughs> we're all going to go together and we're going to Prudhoe Bay. And he's, he didn't, he didn't care about anything. Like we were going whether we wanted to or not. And I said, okay, I will, I'll ride with you for an hour or I'll ride with you, you know, till lunchtime. There was one final gas station that I knew we had coming up um, before the last extended stretch of, of dirt road, you know, before the last, I don't know, 180 miles or 200 miles before Prudhoe Bay. And I said, I'll go to that gas station. And, um, and then I'm, I'm done. Like I'm not, I'm not going farther. And, um, so I rode with Renato for a while and he kept pushing me and pushing me. He was like, Hey, let's go another hour, another hour. Like you can't stop now. And, and I was just getting progressively exhausted. And, and this day started, I think I met Renato at like 10 in the morning. And we rode all day long. And, and this is Alaska in the summertime, so it doesn't get dark. And it was like 10 p.m. It's still bright as day. I pulled off the road because I was so exhausted. And I took off my helmet. And there were just mosquitoes everywhere. And I said to Renato, I said, I'm done, Renato. Like, I'm staying here. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to put up my tent in the, like, the Arctic tundra and just leave me alone, man. I'm done. Like, I'll finish in the morning. And Renato, he was like, no. He was like, we have to finish. He says, the time, the time it takes me to put up my tent, I could, I could, I don't know how to put up my tent. We could be in improved. <laughs> he literally said this, this, this guy, and he's just, he's just poking me and he's just like, just trying to prod me to get on the bike. And I just started swearing at him, you know, and I was like, F you, Renato. And like, you know, I'm, you know, I, and then, you know, after I swore at him for a minute, I put my helmet on and I got on the bike and we kept on going. And around midnight, 
it was around midnight. We're still riding and we had maybe 30 miles to go and we had gone, we had gone hundreds of miles. I don't even remember how far hundreds of miles that day through the mud and I, my bike had been sliding many times and I had gone through lakes of like water and mud and just, just horrible riding. And, and, and I'm just exhausted. And with, with about 30 miles to go run, I had been in front cause I was the slower rider and then the other two guys, Renato and Matt were behind me following me and Renato pulled up right alongside me and he just kind of nodded his head. He looked at me and then he just accelerated and he just took off down the road and I just lost, I lost sight of him over the horizon and, um, and he went on to Prudhoe Bay ahead of me. And, uh, but he knew like at that point we all knew like we were going to make it, we were going to make it cause we were so close and we had been going for, I don't know, 14 hours, you know, riding. It was one of the longest days of probably the longest day I've ever ridden. And Matt and I, we finished in Prudhoe Bay around, I don't know, 1230, one in the morning. And, uh, and we made it and it was, it was just an extraordinary, I had the most extraordinary feeling like that was the hardest day of, of riding my motorcycle I've ever experienced. And I knew like from that point forward, there was no more fear. Like there was no more, I knew that I could ride in like the most horrendous situations. As long as the bike, as long as the bike held up, I knew that I could do it. And the bike was, you know, I had no doubt the bike would hold up. It was just, it was this incredible, um, confidence building, experience and I, I am so fortunate that Renato was there and uh when we arrived in Prudhoe Bay we never found Renato I, I have no <laughs> he was a figment of your imagination does I, he exist it's like fight club he's like Tyler Durden man <laughs> so, so many people have suggested that I have photographs okay with Renato, with Renato in them we never found him I, I assume he like pitched his tent somewhere and uh you know camped out on his own but and he just must have seen. He must have been miserable. He must have seen it on your face. Like this dude is not gonna, is not gonna finish it unless I. Like you became his project. Like he must have known that you needed to be pushed way beyond your limits to like know that you were capable of this. Maybe, maybe. I, I don't know. Um, if that's the case, then then you know, uh, Renato is a very nice person, and he's incredible for pushing me. Um, I mean, I think he wanted, I think he wanted some company. I think he wanted, uh, I, I think everybody out there wanted some company because you, because you hear stories of people getting into accidents on their own out in Alaska and it's, it could be, you know, you can die if, um, if there's nobody there to help you. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know what Renato's deal was. He was, he was an incredible rider. He did not need any help. Um, I think maybe he just wanted some company in case something went wrong. You know, somebody got a flat tire or who knows, but, uh, he did, he pushed me really hard and, and I'm very thankful for that. And, uh, he, he got me to Prudhoe Bay. And so, and he basically, he saved, I mean, he saved my trip. I would have, I, I still would have ridden to Argentina, but he, you know, he made me feel good about, about getting all the way from one end to the other end, you know, from Prudhoe Bay to Ushuaia. I could say I, I went there, I'd been to the end of the road and I achieved this incredibly, it was, it was, it was, there's nothing great in Prudhoe Bay. It's just the tundra. There's like elk and moose, but, but symbolically it was so important to me and to my journey. And, and I got there because of Renato. That's amazing, man. Like, uh, it's crazy to think had he not been there, you could, you could have thrown in the towel. You wouldn't have had those 28,000 miles under your belt <laughs> and incredible stories to boot. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's, I, I guess a lot of it is, uh, it's as much luck and, you know, the kindness of strangers as, as, it is, as it is your own, your own, you know, hard work. Um, so I'm very fortunate. <laughs> That's amazing. 